um, welcome to Good Morning Cranberry. Um, I'm your host, Grya Sumner, and this is our guest, Jim Singerman. So, Jim, just ask her. Good this. morning, Cranberry. Well, my background is I'm I'm 75 years old this year, and I was introduced to the island by my wife Molly when we were just going together about 30 years ago, and introduced invited me to come up and visit and meet her father, um, and uh, Molly was is the youngest of the Newell clan who's been up here on the island. I think since the late 40s, uh, maybe the early 50s. And her grandfather, Sterling Newell, was the, uh, an attorney from Cleveland with, uh, and happened to be at business with uh, Maynard Murch, was attorney for Maynard Murch. And so he'd come up here to the island to visit Mr. Murch to conduct business. And as everyone who does, who steps on Cranberry, they fell in love with it. And uh, fortunately, he bought the two houses where we are on Long Ledge now. So cool. Okay. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Michigan, on the shores of Lake Michigan, on the western side of the state on a farm. We had an 80-acre fruit farm, and I was the eldest boy of uh, five children, a sister and three other brothers. And uh, we had a great time uh, growing up. We didn't have a lot. Um, my father's highest salary when, uh, when he retired was um, around, uh, I think he made around $22,000 the final year that he worked before he went on Social Security. So, but we never really wanted for anything. We felt very lucky because we had family and we had a lot of great friends around in, in Michigan. That's cool. Um, where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school. I started in grade school in a, a one-room schoolhouse that was um, right next to our house. I, I was one of the few who could walk to school. Um, and we had pretty big winters there in Michigan. We did 60 to 80 inches of snow a year, and and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was beautiful because with the farm, with the pine trees and the fruit trees and so on, it was pretty much a Norman Rockwell Christmas time uh, every year with the heavy snows and so on. But uh, I went to school at the one room schoolhouse at first, the kindergarten to the third grade, and then went to a middle school there in Michigan where we took the school bus uh, would pick us up, and so on. Um, what would you do for fun? Uh, for fun, we played, uh, we had a great field. My father loved sports, and, and he set up a baseball field with a, uh, we used chicken wire for the backstop to keep the ball from going too far beyond when we missed it. But the uh, neighborhood kids all rode bikes, and so they'd come down and we'd get enough together, and we'd choose sides and uh, usually play baseball most of the time. Uh, but with the property, the farm we had backed up on some uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources property around 3,000 acres of, uh, of um, preserve, of an area that was safe for animals. and. It was fun just to go out into the woods and watch the animals and flush birds out of the out from the from the meadow or uh, have a deer jump up or watch a fawn and a, and a mother deer in the springtime. It was all it was all really really nice and some of the farms around us had animals. They had goats and cows and horses and so on. So we it was all it was very much a rural community. Well, I, uh, uh, I wasn't real 
good as a, as a uh, student, as an academic uh, in class and studying. If I were to get a good grade on my uh, tests or on my schoolwork, I really had to work for it. My sister, on the other hand, was, was brilliant. She could sit down and look at a test, an exam, whether it was math or science, or, and she'd fill it out and have the answers. She retained information. Everybody learns differently. And I had decided because my youngest brother was born with uh, cerebral palsy, so he was a special needs uh, person and, uh, and lived with us the whole, his whole life at home. Uh, but he was, um, it was for me, uh, I was told early on, you're the oldest boy in the family, so you're expected to go ahead and make something of yourself. But we didn't have the means as a family, all of our income would go to my brother's care. And so uh, we all worked side jobs and mowing lawns or working at a filling station as pumping gas or doing whatever, and bring that money home and it would go toward the expenses. Not, we didn't feel we had to, it was just one of those things we wanted to do as a family. So um, uh, there was, I had learned about when I was being asked what are you gonna be when you grow up? Um, I learned about uh, a trade school for chefs, and I had learned that in America, this was back in the 60s, early 60s, that in America, most of the chefs were in fact individuals who had come here from Europe, from Germany and France and Switzerland and so on, that worked in, and uh, I thought, and, and they were all men, it was, uh, there were those who felt that cooking was woman's work to do it, so it was, was stepping out of the box a little bit to say you're going to be actually a professional chef. So I did that and I um, uh, did it for probably about 12 or 13 years and decided, maybe 15 years, and decided I was going to step out and put on a jacket and tie and get into management. So I took some college classes to supplement what I had learned in the trade school, but I I accomplished, uh, I was a, I'm an Escoffier chef. I took an apprenticeship under some Swiss chefs and uh, worked overseas, um, spent time in the, uh, was drafted into the army during the Vietnam conflict. And, uh, and um, that probably was the single best thing that ever happened to me at the time I didn't think it was. But it was uh, really a, the discipline that it added uh, the understanding of teamwork and working together, the, the things the military offered to a young, young person from the country at that point was significant. So that was, um, yeah, that's how that transpired. Okay. Well, I think it goes, the, the, back then it wasn't, uh, there weren't, uh, a lot of chefs. There was only one chef school here in America at the time. All of the other training for, for chefs was in Europe and a big uh, plus or a star for a, for a hotel or restaurant was that if you brought a European chef over and I believe very much that the American boys could do the same thing. We're all human beings, you just have to decide you're going to commit to it. And so I um, had committed and I had a grandfather who had a third grade education and had a couple of department stores and he was very successful and he said, oh, you don't need to go and this education stuff is overblown and that didn't go over very well with my mother who was his daughter but uh, as she said, no, you need to get an education. But it didn't have to come just from books. It could come from doing things with your hands and more importantly doing things with your mind. And my parents and the people around me always were very big on telling me to be sure to do something that I liked to do every day. Because when you think about it, when you take a job, you're going to do it for probably 20 years or 30 years or maybe 50 years. And you can't fake it for 20 or 30 or 50 years. You have to like doing what you're doing. And so... I got into this and I found things that I enjoyed doing and then I learned that 
if I didn't know how to do something, it was okay, but I needed to find someone around me who could do it, what I didn't know. And so admitting that you didn't know how to do everything, then, you know, we all run into people who do think they know everything about everything. Uh, but admitting that you don't, and then finding people, you, you really find that there are so many people out there who are willing to help you. All you have to do is ask or be open to being helped. And those were a couple of the principles that allowed me to enjoy the successes that I, that I enjoy today. It is cool. So as a chef, did you ever get to like cut really, really, really fast with a knife? Yes, yeah. Did you ever cut your fingers? You know what I, yeah, yeah. I've got cuts on my fingers where I didn't take them all the way off, but they heal, kind of like your foot wheel. Well, after you took a tumble on the bike yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> but I, um, I mean, you're going to burn your fingers. You're going, uh, something I thought maybe we could do at some point in time, which, might be fun is to have uh, here for young people, and I think you should put a, a limit on the age of 14 or 15 of uh, little cooking classes on how to use knives and how to prepare easy stuff to do. But uh, in many cases, when young people go away to boarding school or to university or on with life, uh, some of them haven't gotten the training on how to cook from their parents. I know you have a mom who does a lot of cooking, but by the same with a family. But there are those who don't. And, a, and it's a trade that I think everyone needs to learn as you go on, if it's no more than to just be able to turn on a stove and cook for yourself. So it's fun. And it, the creativity, being able to use things that you never thought you would be able to use, I don't care if it's eggs from a chicken or having grown up on a farm, I understood the agricultural part of it to a greater degree. But um, vegetables and the way stuff grows and uh, it's, if you feel it, if you have a creative side of you, it's great to, to apply it to making things. And, and sometimes you're going to make something and it's not going to taste very good. And all you do is Push it aside and uh, go on and start and make something else. Yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> I made like this log cake, you know, like the blue yep. cakes, and I was doing great until it got the powdered sugar on it. And my mom, she had these bowls, and she put the powdered sugar in one of them, and the baking powder in one of them, or the baking soda. Yeah. And, and they both looked exactly the same. They don't do the same thing. Sure, instead of the powdered sugar. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not bad, but those are those are things that um, uh, it's pretty easy to make some. You can find somebody. Maybe it's your pets that will eat it, but somebody will eat what's the mistakes. And um, you know, there are, there are funny people on um, television as I was growing up. Julia Childs and the first male chef, the French chef with, I think, uh, Adam Graham Kerr, I think was his name or something like that. He had a uh, television program and he'd always say, oh, I must take a drink of wine every time I do something here with the, with the knives or with the other. And he made a point at the beginning, something I learned when I first went to chef school, that very seldom will you ever cut yourself with a sharp knife you usually cut yourself with a dull knife. And most people have dull knives in their drawers. And getting knife sharpeners or keeping knives sharp, the knife slides through whatever you're cutting, whether it's an onion or an apple or a potato or whatever, carrots, whatever it happens to be, it goes through nice and easily. And there's a way that you hold your hand when you're slicing so that you don't put your fingers under where, it's, where you're going to cut. And um, it's like anything else. Uh, whether you're a carpenter, you're going to swing the hammer a number of times before you hit the nail. But once you put enough nails in, you're pretty good at hitting the nail every time. The same thing with cooking. The more you use a knife, but 
The key is having good equipment. You don't have to have a lot of it, but have one or two sharp knives, a large one, a small one, uh, wooden spoons, you, things that, that you're gonna be comfortable with as you cook, and a pan. You'll have a favorite pan, and you may have it when you're married and, and your children are grown. Uh, down the road because that pan had a lot of memories with it of the great things that it made. Last night we celebrated a family birthday and this fellow said, "I one thing I have to have on my birthday is uh, angel food cake. And his, that, and his wife said, well, I don't make great angel food cakes. And he said, well, then I guess I'll make it. So he made his own cake. But we all do those things that um, we feel, like I said, we feel comfortable with. Um, how, now getting to the island part, um, how is the island different than it is today? Well, as I said, I came here about uh, 30 years ago. And for me, I had I had been on islands because I traveled around the world. When I in my work, I travel I traveled 120 or 130 thousand air miles a year for 40 years. So I was on an airplane a lot, and I saw a lot of different countries and a lot of different areas. The thing about Maine um, that was probably most impressive to me was how much Molly and her family, the Newells look forward to coming up here. I mean, this was, she, my wife is uh, 60 years old this year and has spent every summer of her life here on the island. In one of the, uh, with, I, with the exception of the first two years, I think she was two years old when she first came up. But the incentive for the children back then was you had to be potty trained in order to come up to the island. The parents wouldn't let you come up because they didn't have disposable diapers. They didn't have pampers at that point. You had regular cloth diapers that the kids used. And as children would be, you'd be doing nothing but laundry the whole time you're up here if your children weren't trained, potty trained or toilet trained. And so you, you spent time uh, making sure that was an incentive. And once you could go up to the island and once you've been here, and stepped on Great Cranberry or any other island that is meaningful to a person, I don't know why you'd ever not come back as often as you could. And we certainly have. Uh, I have since I met Molly and since I came up here. Where else have I lived? I lived uh, in Michigan and then I moved to Chicago when I went to school uh, because the city had the trade school and it had the option of working in a big hotel and, and um, working on an apprenticeship. So I kind of moved where a job allowed me to, um, to work and do the things I wanted to do with my life. And then from Chicago, I moved back to Michigan for a bit uh, until an opportunity opened up in Flor Lauderdale, Florida. And it wasn't a hard decision because the job offer came to me in the middle of uh, uh, a snowstorm in November when they had closed down the interstate highways in Michigan for, because of this early winter storm. And I got this call and he said, fly down, get to a airplane in Chicago and fly down here and see if you wouldn't like to move here. So the family and I did move down and uh, it, was a, it was a great move. I loved it. It kind of followed a pathway for me though that uh, I didn't set any life goals of where I wanted to be or what I wanted to be. I kind of let life unfold in front of me. Um, and it's different for everyone. But for me, it was, if someone said to me, can you do this? My answer was always yes. I'd find a way to do it. 
I, I worked hard. Didn't make any difference how many hours it took, or whether I was working nights or weekends or holidays. Uh, if I liked doing it, I'd say yes, and I took the job. And in this case, it was to run a restaurant and a golf club and country club in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, for Robert Trent Jones, a golf course architect. He did some 500 golf courses around the world. Uh, was probably the most prolific golf course architect in America for 30 years, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Until everyone else kind of got into that business, but it was uh, after I worked for him and ran his operation for him for a bit, he then made me an officer in his companies, and I ended up being the president of Robert Trent Jones International, and that added to my travel because he was in his late 70s, 80s at that time, and every place he traveled to do a, a to build a golf course. Um, in Spain and North Africa, Morocco, uh, Italy, um, England, uh, Ireland, Scotland. Um, it was, um, I would travel there to manage the contracts, to manage the construction. And so it was, that unfolded for me. And then a little further on in, uh, in my life, after I'd done that for about nine years, Mr. Jones had gotten older, he was in his late 80s. And I was retiring, so um, I got a call from Washington, D.C., and they said, would you like to come and run the Club Managers Association of America? And I said, I've never run an association. I don't know, have any idea what it is you need done. And they said, well, we want someone with a business background. And our business at the time was a $30 million construction and design business for golf courses. Um, but that you also have a background in culinary arts and uh, uh, as a chef, but as a club manager, as a restaurant manager, and that all fits into what we'd like to do. So for 25 years, I was the CEO of the Club Managers Association of America, and we had 3,800 private clubs and uh, 7,000 members, individual, personal, professional members, uh, in 30 37 or 38 countries around the world. And that's kind of what I did until I retired three years ago um, and got to spend more time up in Maine. memory of the island was um, well certainly coming up here because I had no idea when they said it's an island whether we were going to row a boat out. I'd been on canoes before, I'd been in rowboats before, I'd been in power boats before living on Lake Michigan but I had no idea uh, when they said we're going to take the mail boat out what that meant and so all of a sudden we're going down onto this float and the float's rocking and rolling around and it was a bit windy and the boat was coming up and I'm thinking, I'm not so sure this was one of my better ideas. Until we got off and we were at low tide and I had overpacked, so I had a suitcase that had enough things in it I could have moved out here. Um, and by the time I pulled it up the, the ramp to the town dock and then um, Molly had had the Green Dragon, the 48 Plymouth that her father had brought up here around 1950 or thereabout. He's been on the island ever since, but had that there. And I looked and I thought, wow, this is really a step back in time. And it wasn't even so much that as it was that I, all of a sudden I began to understand how the ownership that everyone who was here on the island summer people or full-timers, um, how much ownership they had in the island community, how much they loved the island community and being here. And probably my most memorable thing that's happened to me in 30 years here was when I finally got Junior Bracey to say something more than a grunt or a nod when I said good morning to him walking down the dock. 
and Scott had, wasn't old enough at that point to go out on a boat or to take him, go out with his dad. And I'd say, morning, Junior, and he'd just keep walking. And it was probably, it was years. I want to say three, four, five, six years before he finally said, morning. And I thought, holy cow, that was, he actually talks for this one. And it was just persistence that, and it wasn't, he wasn't being unkind. He just was on a mission to go and do what he was going to do. And that was go out and look for critters out in the lobster pots. And then probably the next momentous thing was when Junior said, you want to come out? I'm going tomorrow. And I thought, well, first of all, if I get seasick pretty easy, like maybe a hundred yards off the mooring and I'm kind of toward the back of the boat. Oh yeah, happens to a lot of people, go ahead. And then Junior said, well, why don't you, uh, so I go out with him on the boat as a deckhand and it was fairly rough seas. There were four or five foot swells that for me, that was rough and it did not contribute to my well-being as a little bit seasick at that point. And I had been foolish enough to have eaten a relatively big breakfast before we went out, which also wasn't a brilliant thing to do. But we're going and he said, well, are you going to work or are you going to stand there? And I said, well, can you tell me what I can do? And I was very proud because I had on a Tilly hat that Molly's father had given me. And so I had my Tilly on and I was in um, blue jeans and I was all, I was ready. I said, sure, I'll work. What do you want me to do? And he said, here, fill bait bags. And he threw a handful of uh, little bait bags. Uh, and I said, what do I do with them? He said, fill them up with bait. And he's trucking along and he's got the little buoy hook that he's getting ready to pull things up. And he said, and I need them full here so when I get it up, I, we don't stop. We just keep going. I'm thinking, oh man, this is going to be something. So I started stuffing bait bags and it it, it, that also did not contribute to my um, somewhat unsettled stomach. But you got over it pretty quick. And so after about an hour, we're going along and I was just amazed at how Junior found these lines of pots of buoys and how it would, I said, how do you not get lost out here? I'm doing it all my life. It wasn't a lot big on words. But he said, go ahead and, uh, and he said, just keep the big bag coming. And with that, he swung the buoy uh, hook around with the pole, knocked my tilly off into the bait box. And all of a sudden, all of the juice started running into the middle of the hat. And I just looked at it and shook my head. And I thought, boy, this is going to be a day that I'll remember. And I have remembered it for a long time. And so I picked my hat up. And naturally, I didn't put it back on, but I kind of tossed it over at the end. Went on with the day, and at the end of the day, it was a, it was a big, um, it was a big deal that I had survived in my own mind. And Molly naturally was thinking, you know, I know Jun Junior's going to bring him back alive, but this could be a big experience for, for us when he came back in and. I came to the door and I had bait juice all over my jeans and I didn't have the, um, rubber boots or anything else. And she said, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea if you were to just get, go right upstairs and throw everything into the washing machine. And, and I said, you yeah, know, that's good. So we had one bathroom in the house and it was the laundry because the plumbing was up there. There was a laundry and there was an old bath, footed bathtub up there and so I took my clothes off, threw them in the washing machine, started it, and then I ran the tub and think I'm going to take a quick bath and get some of this odor off of me before I get done. And I just sit down in this nice warm bath and with that the washing machine kicked into the spin cycle. And I hadn't realized it, but the washing machine drained into the tub. And so in my nice warm bath, all of a sudden, all of this juice in the laundry 
was shooting into the tub and the tub was filling up. We were on the second floor and I'm thinking, my God, I'm going to flood the, this wonderful old house that we're in. It was just a continuation of what I thought maybe be the longer day of my life before we got done. So I grabbed the drain and drained it out, let it go through the cycle as it did and then filled the tub again. And naturally at that point, all the hot water was gone. So I took a cold bath and dried off and just figured it might be better just to wait for tomorrow and see if it isn't a better day. But it was, uh, it was funny in retrospect, but at the time it was, uh, and I subsequently went have gone out with Junior on other occasions and with Scott. Uh, and you have a real appreciation for what it takes to bring lobster to the table for all of us when we enjoy it and just call and say, can you give me six or can you give me four or can you do whatever. It's um, the fishermen, whatever they can get for their, whatever they harvest, um, they're certainly entitled to it. That's a hilarious story. <laughs> well, there are personalities in life that you run into that you'll always remember. I'll never forget Junior Bracey and my first trip on the, on the crustacean. Okay. Um, do you have any pets? We have a, we had a pet. I, we, I always had a, a pet dog when we were on the farm. Never had cats. Uh, but um, had the dog and uh, with our girls, when you get a pet, it generally falls to the mother to walk it and feed it. And everyone says, oh, no, no, we can get this. And we'll take care of it. We'll do it. But it generally falls to the, to the mother at home to do it. And Molly, uh, my wife, is just the most wonderful mother, uh, wife, uh, mother to a pet that you could possibly find. So she would always walk the dog. But we had Bella, our wonderful dog, for well, 15 years, 14 or 15 years. And Bella just passed away this past summer. And it's really left a big hole for all of us, uh, primarily for me. I never felt that I was gonna ever get that close to a pet. And uh, I don't know, I guess it's like everything else in life. You, until you experience it, you don't know how it's going to impact you for that. But uh, pets are great friends. Um, Bella was a great friend, and maybe someday we'll have another dog. But uh, for right now, we're just, it was only a few months ago, so uh, we'll, we're just getting past that. But great memories, wonderful memories. Of, and we've got pictures and everything else. That Virginia? Uh-huh. And uh, he was the best draft horse ever, and he died sadly. That's hard. Yeah. Did you spend a lot of time with him? Mm-hmm. Did George ever lay down in a stall? No, we didn't really keep him in a stall. He always like just like Was out in the field? Mm-hmm. His best friend got electrocuted by lightning. His name was Rich, George and Rich. They were good friends. They were both horses. And they were, like, were they both draft horses? Uh -huh. Yeah, they're big. Yeah, they were so they were big too. They were big. Look at their feathers; they're huge feathers too. So, yeah. Um, uh, Ridge was near a uh, um, a power line, and lightning just struck it. Oh, it struck the power line and then electrocuted Ridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those awful things that happen in life. And you know, but it, it, when you think about it, uh, one thing I learned from my brother, my youngest brother, when you talk about life stories, um, he was born with cerebral palsy. He had special needs. Uh, we didn't understand it as kids out on a farm. We hadn't been exposed to individuals with special needs much. But I probably learned the, the greatest life's lessons at that time in my life. I was a young teenager. Um, but to make the very most of every single day that you've got with anything that means anything to you in life. Don't think 
well, I can say hello to them tomorrow, or I can go out and play with them the next week, or to do that. Because as soon as you walk away from the opportunity to have a good experience, you won't have that opportunity again. So what's great is you go ahead and you say, um, you know, this may put me out a little bit, and maybe I'm gonna be just a little bit late, but I'm going ahead and doing this. And you find some of the greatest experiences. It's here on the island when volunteering. But your family does an amazing job. Your mom and dad and, and you kids, all of you, have done such an amazing job. The, uh, the merch children, John and James and all of them, and working as they do in the Hitties Cafe or down at the store or uh, mowing lawns or doing whatever it is you all do, uh, the work you all do around with your animals around the house. Um, uh, those are experiences looking back in life as they may seem like work now, but looking back, there's something you're gonna learn from every one of those experiences. And I just say, don't pass, don't pass up the opportunity or put off the chance that you have to learn something uh, or to meet someone or to have an experience with someone. The fact that you guys are doing these interviews that you've done here at uh, Cranberry are, are really remarkable. And when they're put out for other folks to uh, listen to, I mean, you, you learn a lot about um, we're, we're not real good today about sitting and listening to other people. In some cases, we're good at telling other people what we want to do, but li actually listening and learning, there's some really interesting people on this island. Some of them are year-rounders, and some of them are um, uh, day trippers, or some of them are summer people, uh, but, and some of them are family members uh, who come up to visit. But this island seems to change everybody when you get here. I mean, change everyone for the better. It, it's really a really remarkable place. And, and I just, uh, you know, on one hand, it's a shame that everyone can't experience it. But on the other hand, if everyone could experience it, it wouldn't be so special. But having it so close to Acadia and uh, the National Park and having the other things that if you decide to, you can do them. But one of the people on the show this past week when I was volunteering as a driver um, said, you know, well, I came out here and I had to make the next boat because it was going to be three hours before the boat came after that. But she said, I got off and I walked on a trail off of the back shore to the big rocks, to the pink granite rocks. And she said, I sat there and it was like it was, I was hypnotized watching the waves crash in. I went down to one of the tidal pools and I saw a starfish and a crab in there and then the gull came down and ate the starfish um, as it would. And she said, I thought, I don't want to make that next boat. I'm going to wait for the three hours for the, for the six o'clock boat as it would come. And I think that's something that, that everyone who takes the time when you're here on the island, you can't force things to happen any faster than what they're going to happen. And it's kind of neat to, not just to experience it myself, but it's neat. I, we, we went home to Washington, D.C., Alexandria, Virginia, for a, where we live when we're not up here, and for a wedding two weeks ago, ten days ago. And I couldn't wait to get in the car and come back up here. It's a 14-hour drive, but it's worth it. Washington, yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, depending on how much traffic you run into on the GW Bridge in New York or the parkways of Connecticut or, but it's easier doing that on the way up here because you know you're going to get here to Great Cranberry eventually. It's harder on the way down because then you know you're going back to the hustle and bustle and the schedule of the bigger city. Which is nice. I, it was a good experience. We we lived there for thirty years, and it was it was marvelous. But nothing's like the island. Mm. Okay, ready for my last question? 
Last question. Let's go. If you were to give advice to me or other children coming to the island, what would it be? Um, put your cell phones away. Um, I know you're going to have to get to them periodically to look things up. And now with the, the connectivity of Axiom and fiber optics and everything, now we can access pretty quickly uh, the outside world if we need to. But there is so much here on the island to enjoy. And I don't care if it's a walk down one of the trails and to see the sun on the moss or to see the bright red cranberries against the moss or it's the wildlife and not significant but I mean I was walking along the road outside where our house is here just uh, two days ago and a deer came out and startled me and I, I stopped and the deer looked at me and I'm looking at it actually not quite sure what to do next with this one and with that, the deer walked a few more steps out and stopped, looked at me again, and went right off back into the woods. It didn't run and wasn't startled or anything. And I guess that's the moment that you're going to have when you're standing on the dock as a dock hopper and jumping off into 50 degree water, something the kids do every time they're up here. I do periodically. Now, it helps me if I have a little glass of scotch before I do it. but. Still, that keeps me warm. Uh, but watching a, a school of fish as the tides change, or sitting on our porch and watching boats go by, we miss the osprey nest on the... I would say to kids, let the island experience get a hold of you. Um, and that's not really definitive, because uh, you say, what do you mean get a hold of me? But you take a deep breath and don't try to make something happen kind of let it happen here for you on the island. And it would go to the thing I mentioned just a little bit earlier. Uh, don't pass up the opportunity to meet a person. Wave at them. Admit that the person coming by, you don't know them, you don't know what they're gonna do, but admit that they're a human being. And just acknowledge that they're a human being by waving and saying hello, or smiling at them. They're doing something. and. We often are critical, my generation and older people are critical of young people and say, oh, you guys, you don't do it the way we do. And so I, I can only tell you my observations are coming from our nation's capital and traveling around the world that we're in pretty good shape. We're lucky to have the country that we've got. We're lucky to have the opportunities we've got. We're not perfect. We've got a lot of wrinkles and warts and things that don't look good maybe to the rest of the world, but there's no place in the world better than where we are right here in America and to a greater degree here on Great Cranberry Island. And so as young people, have the confidence to know that you are going to make the difference in somebody else's life and you're going to do a lot of things right as you move forward and just let life happen. Enjoy it. I mean, it's just, we're so fortunate to have people and the country and the, uh, the things that we've got around us. Um, and enjoy family. Family. Nothing's more important than family. That's it. Good morning, Cranberry. Good morning, Cranberry. <laughs> All right. You're a good interviewer. Remember how to turn this off, do you, Karaya? I probably There's do. There's a red light here, and I'm yes. not sure. Yes. On my camera, it is right here. That may be it. Uh,